Good afternoon, everybody. Eddie Webb, we are here at the New Media Lab. Today, we have a special guest from our district office down at uh, Maricopa Community College's Dr. Stephen Crawford, who uh, has his degree in innovation and education and has quite a, a story for uh, his expertise in the field of technology. Recently, Dr. Crawford has been involved in distance learning. His career ex expands over 20 years at multiple institutions as a technologist, instructional designer, and adjunct faculty. We want to welcome Dr. Stephen Crawford to the New Media Lab. How you doing, brother? Thank you very much, Eddie. Doing great. We made a decision to start putting out the podcast across the district rather than just on our campus. And uh, that's been a really great thing to hear from folks. And you're one of them, you and... Uh, uh, Rob Morales. Good guy, man. Yeah, yeah. he's a fantastic instructional designer yeah. with the team. Yeah, so you guys reached out and uh, wanted to talk about innovation and entrepreneurship and as well as how the district is doing with distance learning these days in, in the midst of a COVID. So how are we doing? You know, it, it, it's been interesting. Uh, distance learning as a concept is not what we're doing in many cases here in the district. And as a pandemic response, we're, the model we're more looking at is kind of what I came up under with uh, live television, you know, and, and broadcasting courses over satellite. And so it's more of a remote teaching. But the 10 colleges are doing a really good job. There's obviously some things that you just can't do online. You've got to be in person to do. And and those programs are trying to find their way and, and, and how to do things safely in a COVID environment. And, and they're doing a good job with that. What's the biggest challenge you're facing these days? For me, um, I, for, you know, being separated from the colleges, I don't have the challenges they have. And so the challenges I'm witnessing are, you know, I think about our friends in the healthcare professions where they have to have clinical hours. Right. And my previous role, I was with a college of nursing. So I know how important that is that the state requirements require you to have so much clinical time. So that means putting yourself at risk, which thankfully the vaccines are helping to minimize now. But I also look at those in the uh, career and technical education fields where you, you know, automotive and avionics is a great example, welding, where you're not going to be able to practice those skills at home for lots of reasons, some of it's safety, and you just need to be in the classroom to do those types of things. But there's a lot of good things going on where a lot of faculty are seeing how they can um, transmit content in a different way. And by doing that, they can now make themselves more available to have other conversations that they may not have done in the past. So they're recognizing that they can look at things from a synchronous point of view versus an asynchronous point of view. And that way, they're, they're really use, utilizing that one-on-one -on -one time or that class time with students much more uh, richly to help the students. Oh, that's, that's, um, that's great, man. Yeah. Change and moving with change, you know, growing in, in many different facets. I mean, COVID has sort of forced everyone into looking at distance learning through the technology, you know, and uh, getting comfortable with that. Having, I've been in the classroom for a bunch of years and, um, you know, I started to try to recreate a face-to-face -face experience online, which is almost impossible in many ways. But the new challenges and the way it has uh, restructured curriculum and delivery and all of that, I think it's, uh, it's, it's definitely been interesting. But I hear, you know, when you go into the occupational and trade side, yeah, it makes perfect sense that I don't know how you would teach welding. I mean, anybody could just watch a YouTube video. Why do they need to come to school, right? Well, and the safety aspect, you know, yeah. if you're going to practice welding and um, you've got to be in an environment where other people won't be watching you weld without safety precautions because you can damage their eyesight. Uh -huh. So you just can't do it in your backyard, right? you right. know, because your neighbor looking through the window down into your backyard could have some eyesight damages. Just a simple little fact like that. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting. And, and that word could come coming up a lot, the word interesting. And um, COVID has created an opportunity to really reevaluate what we're doing and 
what we should be doing. And, and that's been a big thing for us as well at MCLI. We've looked at things and said, hey, what are, the, what are things that we're doing today that doesn't make sense anymore? And before, I think a lot of us were afraid to make certain changes because of the fact that, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Well, COVID kind of came in and broke everything. And so that excuse went out the door. And so now we have a chance to go, okay, everything is broken. What do we fix first and how do we fix it? And how do we do it in a way that's equitable? And that's one of the biggest problems with uh, distance learning and remote learning is that many of our students still live on the wrong side of the digital divide. We have forgotten over the years that that exists. And so we know that a lot of our students and a lot of our faculty and staff as well are limited by the amount of bandwidth they have. You know, we know that in some parts of the state, there are just, there just isn't a hardwire internet to someone's house. And that means, and, and in some parts of, of even downtown Phoenix, you just can't afford it. It's not there at a high quality. And so your phone is the better quality, but that's limited and also pricey. So yeah. as we look at those problems and we think about how do we solve problems, online is a great solution. And one of the things that for MCLI as we look at the programs we deliver to faculty, our Student Success Conference, we had the most successful one from an attendance standpoint um, this past fall than we've ever had in our 30 plus year history of the event. Mm. We had over a thousand people participate. And some of the comments we got was along the lines of, you know, I just, I can't drive to, I can't drive from the remote part of the district to the event because it's an hour and a half one way drive. And so when you eliminate a three hour car drive for a six hour event, you know, that starts to make it more valuable. When you make it online, you span it over a couple of days, you now make it so that everyone in the office can participate as opposed to just a select few. So that's one of the things we've been looking at is how can we, you know, use this opportunity to try out new technologies as people are more welcoming into them. And, and the comments we've gotten is, please continue to do this post pandemic whenever that is, because this has been, this has left us up into a higher level than we've ever been before and more accessible. That's exciting to find a, a niche and, uh, you know, inspiration from a community. I think our team over here at Mesa, because of the New Media Lab and, and some other programs that faculty have started over here, we started dealing with bandwidth and access to technology and making sure that, you know, the the challenges our students face from an economic perspective that they we were able to issue computers, you know, that they could take home and had an intervention at people's homes to uh, fund internet uh, services. And so these guys over here did an amazing job. You know, we've been, we I think we were way out in front for a long time. And our whole goal, of course, was to, uh, when we started off, it was the lecture that you saw me do a few years back was modernizing, you know, the written word. And then recently, if I've, I've done some presentations and I'm talking about normalizing and distance learning in, in, in those, in that balance, you know, a thousand, was it students or faculty, faculty? That was faculty and staff. Yeah, faculty and staff. Yeah, I mean, people are wanting to know, right, how to do this sort of stuff. But I think the same challenges exist, you know, just like we can't teach welding from distance. We also, you know, can't teach community in the same way, critical thinking in the same way, citizenship in the same way. And, and, and that's what I'm hearing from my students. First, everybody kind of dug that they didn't have to drive to school. And now everybody's like, you know, I really want to be in a in a classroom with other human beings. I do want to ask you one question because of, of the conferencing thing, just because it came up in my class last week of uh, where students are getting um, screen fatigue. Have you heard of this? Because I, I hadn't heard of it. Before. I, I, I think myself and my team at MCLI has been feeling it probably since April. I mean, we were a month in and we realized I'm on the screen a lot. And so... Yeah, there's, there's a lot to that. I think when I think about our students and I think about the future, I look, you know, first off, whenever I hear someone say distance learning is the future of higher education, I cringe. I've cringed for over 20 years when I've heard that phrase. There will always be a part of the population who wants distance learning, who are self-regulated and they want to learn on their own because they're place-bound maybe, 
because they're time bound, whatever the case may be, there's always going to be a part of the population who wants that, who needs that handholding, for lack of a better term. They need that interaction. They need that framework of, I need to go to a classroom two, three times a week and work with a faculty member and work with my other students to be successful. And then there's going to be a group of students who want a little bit of both. And I hope that this opens up that middle ground so that we can deliver an education to a student who is just really busy. They're, they're busy with their career, trying to keep, you know, keep the bills coming in and going out, keep money in, bills out, you know, and everything paid. But at the same time, advance themselves through education. So I think, we're, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll see more of a blended learning approach where we may only ask the student to come into the campus once a week, but the online, whether they're synchronous or asynchronous, would allow them to do what needs to be done in between. And I think that's important. And that goes into that, you know, webinar fatigue, that web conferencing fatigue. You know, when you are on camera, looking at a camera, and you're not getting that visual feedback that you're an individual being, you know, paid attention to, it's tiring. And uh, so my team, I've been, you know, it's like, look, if if you're in too many meetings, block off a block of time. And, you know, when the weather's nice, being here in Arizona, that's often, take a little walk. Just get a 10-minute walk in that usually refreshes and you're ready to go. And so I've been trying really hard not to schedule our meetings anymore, but try to keep them to 45, 50 minutes whenever possible, end them early so myself and others could do just that. When you're going back to back to back, it is, it is rough. It is hard on everybody. And I can only imagine how hard it is on our students who may be struggling with bandwidth. Again, their best internet could be in their car. And imagine sitting in your car for three hours trying to do online classes. It's like, yeah. I, I, yeah, I feel for them. Yeah, I mean, it's a real thing when, when it starts, you know, it starts coming up now after a couple of semesters. It's something we can't ignore. You know, and I think what's going to happen is I've actually seen a, on ProQuest, I've seen a couple of new dissertations coming out around this culture because I want to, uh, I really like that word uh, elevate, which you talked about, around these both of these ways of delivering education face-to-face and online, because it seems like the variables that we use to talk about them are still sort of, I mean, you use the word handheld. That's, that's really not the case. It's, it's that we're, we want human contact, right? You, know, you want to look at someone you're talking to. You want to have a, a social experience because most of the, a lot of learning actually happens in the hallway after class with students, you know, being able to go up to a workspace in the library. And I mean, when I look back at my education, that was, I mean, the lecture was fine, but it was for me, the real growing when I was hanging out with other students, you know, a pile of books and everybody just, you know, arguing and, you know, like you can't, you can't, you can replace that online a little bit, but it's still not the same. And then there are clearly significant strengths for distance learning, like, like, cause you know, I mean, I'm a tribal member. So, you know, if we have folks that are way, you know, off in rural places, we don't, you know, it used to be you would literally mail them material. They would yep. read it, mail it back, right? So I want to make sure that when we talk about these variables, that we're always talking about the strengths of them from a really, you know, where so that we're not, yeah. you know what I'm And, and I think a better at. word for handheld is high yeah. touch. And, 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 you know, I think the high five, that, you know, how many you know, students miss that high five from their faculty member, whether it's verbally or an, a physical high five for for yeah. struggling, persevering, and getting it done. Yeah. Well, there's that too. I guess there's that uh, approval thing, but I still think it's more about the environment, right? About mm-hmm. people want to interact with other human beings, you know? As I look back at my career, I see so many different opportunities. And when we moved into distance learning at my first institution 20, 25 years ago, we were really trying to reach that student who had no, they just couldn't get the education any other way. So they were highly motivated. And, and the environment's changed since then. You know, it's now gone to most students. And, and some of those students who were highly motivated were submarine officers who we were mailing DVDs to. <laughs> and they couldn't interact with the instructor because they didn't know how long it would be before the submarine would resurface yeah, and yeah. send out data transmissions. Perfect example. 
those are the things that, yeah, we have to build on our strengths, you know, and not get into a sort of a competitive thing. But we, the reason we have distance learning is because the holistic approach to access to education, because it's exciting to get to learn. And we don't want to leave anybody out for whatever reason. And, you know, for us, one, I mean, outside of distant learning, just into the uh, innovation and entrepreneurial aspect of this is, you know, we, that's one of the things that I wanted to do with the new media lab was to teach, you know, media and technical skills that I know students are going to need at least in the future, in the immediate future. Like it's not going to hurt for them to know how to do podcasts, you know, like we're sitting here setting up microphones and recorders and then post-production. If you can apply for a job and you could go, you know, I can make a PSA or an animation or something. All of a sudden you're, you're head of the pack. Yes, very much so. Yeah. And that's what I, cause I mean, studying Chaucer and Beowulf and, you know, all the, the canon in the language arts, we need that history and that culture, but it's also, we need to know how to use QuickTime and Final Cut and Premiere and audition and uh, what, what's the one you're using now, Keegan, a lot, uh, Blender. So I'm working with a high school in uh, San Francisco, a guy I actually uh, yes, went to Blender. college with, and we were making films 100 years ago. He runs, they kind of have a new media lab kind of thing. It's, it's more towards a video production. So I've been helping him the last few years, and uh, all of a sudden he's telling me, man, my students, these 16, 15-year-olds have found this program it's free called blender and i'm like no way i said our guy at our uh you know the guy that runs our uh, editing stuff over here he just he just sent me the blender package and it was i did my first animation it took me maybe an hour you know to make a sun come over a mountain and a car go down a road and i was all proud <laughs> of course and then keegan's like yeah but the wheels aren't turning and i'm like give me a minute man you know what i mean like knowing that stuff is here it's an asset well it's it's funny because there are new media labs in higher ed all across the country whose legacy goes back you know, two decades and more. There used to be this thing called the New Media Consortium, and I was part of that early part of my career. And uh, you know, we had, we had a new media lab that we had built, and it was unfortunately aimed not at students from that point of view, but we were aimed at, at faculty and our goal, but different institutions had their set up in different ways. And so you know, we were looking on how do we bring the digital element into the classroom? How do we, and that's what a lot of us were doing. Some were focused, you know, more on how do we help our students develop digital rhetoric? How do we help our students develop skills in these new, in these new programs that are emerging? Uh, at their conference, I re, I'll, I'll never forget at their conference, I walked out once uh, from one of the keynote sessions. And as I walked out, they gave you version one of Apple's Aperture which was their version back in the day of Photoshop oh. and, uh, and Lightroom. I have that. Yep. And, and then I, another year I walked out and they handed me a copy of Macromedia's authorware for developing different things. And so Macromedia was part of that, which now is owned by Adobe. Adobe was part of that. And these companies saw that it was people like us who were going to be helping our faculty and our students learn these tools and change what comes next. And right. that change has been slow, but man, right. it's, it's happening and our students are really diving into it, which is exciting. Yeah, it has accelerated. And you look at these tools now, it's like now you have DaVinci Resolve, which is a yeah. free um, for students to use for video editing. Yeah, I, I have to be careful with talking about vendors, but we, yeah, I have that. You know, this is my, this is the part I miss about the in face-to-face -face conferencing with my colleagues across the United States is this, thing yeah right this is because you know after the speeches and we're all hanging out in the lounge and lobby and everything inevitably it starts becoming a who did what first and when thing and i love that competition i mean we've the you know like yeah well i was doing this yeah well i was doing you know and and, and i just love that because all of a sudden everybody kind of you have this moment where you go we're all nerds right oh yeah and it's like yep <laughs> and, and, and the best part is even if you were doing it first yeah you weren't doing it all and right. so that's there was right. there's still so much to learn from each other right yeah no. that's that, that's so how exciting. i met some of the folks from the district 20 years ago was through that new media consortium when i was doing that role back out east yeah yeah i 
published a book in the, I think, I can't remember, what, 99 or something like that. And that was really my first exposure working with a, a designer who was very, at that time, proficient in Photoshop. And of course, taking a print or a, like, you know, paint, paint media into animation, sort of. And uh, ever since then, I mean, I was hooked. I didn't really understand it because I didn't have that background. I'm, I'm old enough where I grew up throwing rocks at my brothers, not sitting around a, you know, a TV. I don't even know if we had a TV, you know, but I just fell in love with it immediately when I went to film school. So they, back then we were still shooting on film and then editing with Avid. So you'd have to save all your lunch money to send it off somewhere to get it digitized and then come back and then, and, uh, Keegan was actually one of the lab techs over at the Scottsdale Film School. I was, I about pulled my hair out with Avid, right? I just, I just couldn't, I just couldn't get there. It just, it, when I looked at it on the screen, it looked like a big mess in my brain. And one day, one of the tech guys goes, you know what? Because uh, I had purchased one of the first DSLR cameras. Guy said, hey, let me show you this thing called Premiere. And as soon as it populated on the screen, my brain, I could feel the, my brain just went, and I'm like, I know exactly what to do with this. And now it's been all these years of learning the, the, the tools. And Keegan is, you know, one of the best editors around. And so I have him and Paul Hickey is also phenomenal, right? But immediately it was like my brain knew, knew it. It was, a, it was the most amazing thing that ever happened. For me now, as an old guy, get to see young students have that same experience. There's nothing. There isn't anything like watching. And these kids, like, they, they were, a couple of them knew how to take some pictures and stuff, but we, we literally rebuilt a set in our studio to make it look somewhere else. And now, like, for me, they're basically like, uh, hi, Mr. Webb, uh, do you mind getting out of our way? <laughs> you know what I mean? And to me, there's... You know what I'm saying? Oh, I do. There isn't anything, anything I know of that's, that's like a drug to go, wow, that and, just happened. And, you know, and I was, so yeah, so my path was more as a programmer. I actually was writing the software and a lot of the coding behind the scenes. So things like authorware was where I really got excited because I, would, I, would, I could do some of the basics with the, the media side of it. I knew, I knew enough of audio to be dangerous. I knew enough of the visual side to be dangerous. I knew enough to ask the right questions, but for me, it was like, if I could have somebody else work on that piece and I just import it in and then do all the programming behind the scenes so that it could go from one thing to another and, 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 and operate from that standpoint, that was where I, I excelled. I was more of a programmer and, you know, and I felt like, I'll be honest, I felt like there were times I'm like, okay, I'm in this, in this digital arts world and I get it because of the digital side, but I was still learning and I still am learning so much on the yeah. art side. Um, yeah. I mean, I love photography. I love doing my own video. I, I'm, I'm trying to get back into 360 video because I think that's something really cool that we're just not doing enough of yet. So, so these are some of the things that as I look at, I just, I, I see so many of these possibilities of just where things are going to go. Yeah. What I hope our listeners um, heard right there is something that I was told early on as a filmmaker 25 years ago, and it took me a long time to finally get it through my thick skull. This is a team sport. And if people could really see, like our summer institutes that we do, how all of this process is built around, listen, I know how to do this piece really well, but I'm, I don't know this piece. And the other person says, oh, I know how to do that piece, but I don't, you know, and all of a sudden, you have this learning community that works together. And to me, I find it really, really fascinating. I've been actually trying to study some neurobiology around why that is around creativity and how when you put the left brain people with the right brain people, you get some really amazing results. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And, and, and people are down because there's no conflict there. There's no competition. It's a really team sport. There's, there isn't any, again, you know, that's just, there isn't really anything like that. Whole you know, and, and that makes me call back to Tom Friedman with his world is flat book. You know, yeah. all those years ago, he was, he wrote up, you know, stories about, Hey, look at Georgia tech. Here's an engineering school. These, who are the best engineers? The ones who are musicians. 
Yeah. And because they understand the give and take of how a band plays. And I think yeah. it's a great metaphor for how a good team needs to operate. You know, sometimes you need to play loud and take the set, take, you know, go up front and be the star and then kind of rotate back into the background and let someone else shine for a bit. Yeah. And that's, and, and I've, you know, I didn't come back to teaching uh, till I was 40. And before that, I, you know, ran businesses and, and, and I, you know, all the guys my age that have done well in business, I ask them all the time, hey, do you want me to send you someone who's a team player, who knows how to critical think, who's innovative? They're like, that's why we pay all these taxes. That's exactly what I hope you're doing that, right? Exciting stuff, uh, innovation, entrepreneurship, distance learning. One area we wanted to talk about here was how to start building these articulations and stuff between the innovation that's happening within the Maricopa community colleges and uh, businesses and other associations outside the district. How are we doing there? You know, I think we're doing better than we realize. And I think part of the problem is, is that there are so many well-kept secrets. And, and that's one of the things at MCLI we're trying really hard to do. And that is get a spotlight and shine it on those opportunities. At the district office, you know, we don't do as much as the colleges because the faculty and the students are at the colleges and they're the ones who are really interacting with the, uh, the community and, and the businesses and the different organizations. And they're doing it in great pockets. And so the way I look at things is our job is to help scale those and make people aware of them. And so working with different faculty and different groups across the district, we've been able to connect people and have them realize you're doing something cool you're doing something almost identically cool. You should work together, bounce ideas off each other, and see where you can go from there without competing. And I think that's sometimes some of the biggest problems we run into is that we accidentally compete when we don't even realize we're competing with ourselves. We've had some discussion around that because I've, um, one of the other things, uh, the name of the New Media Lab here is a place of belonging. Uh, we wanted people to come here and be able to express and uh, explore all ideas politically you know historically uh any any, any topic is oh, a fair game you know and but we teach that in you know in respect and uh, to be you know learners real scholars and real learners so one of the things that we stress all the time again is back to this teamwork and community and all that just started some conversations with faculty at glendale community college to see how we could partner right, with their programs and our programs, that they're on the occupational side and we're on the academic side. That dynamic is something I hope in the future it starts to ease and soften a little bit because it does become a competitive thing and then we get into these silos and territory and all that. So as a result of that, uh, we started working with our dean here uh, on their, on the occupational side to see if we could, how we could partner and how, what does that look like. But the problem is the, the equity to resources and the way it's allocated around from top down. And, you know, it's something we have to work through. And oh, yes. I'd like to see, I'd like, I, now I sort of understand when you work really hard to build something and then it starts to either get duplicated or, you know, somebody else has a, a new thing going on and then you start to lose your resource, you know. So these are real things that people in their lives we face, but I think we could do a better job of ensuring that good, good programs and things do thrive and don't get pruned away because of bureaucracy. You know what, you know what I mean? I do. Yeah. It, well, it, I'll phrase it a different way. Um, Dr. Karen Sada talks about toes, turf, and control. Yeah. And, and that is, it's, there are three barriers you run into when doing things. And, and when you can find a coalition of people who aren't worried about getting their toes stepped on or stepping on somebody else's toes, people who aren't worried about protecting turf or trying to gain turf, when people aren't trying to either gain or maintain control of something, that's where, again, it comes back to that teamwork. It's almost like a jazz band at that point where, again, People are, 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 are willing to, to give and take as needed in the instance. But when you have, you know, things set up in a way where 
in silos, that that that's exactly what happens is people start getting worried about toes, turf, and control, and and they want to protect theirs because they're afraid if somebody else takes it, it may lose their identity. They may lose it may it may become something they didn't intend, and that's you know and that's one of the things at MCLI we are trying to help navigate, and we recognize that is a that is one of the barriers when working with others that. We just have to accept, and our goal is not to come in and run anything. Our goal is not to take it over. Our goal is to help connect people, and and we know that, you know, people are uncomfortable, you know, doing certain things, especially giving up control. But if we can, you know, get people together who have an interest, you know, have a desire that that align, hopefully they can do that on their own, and they don't need us to to figure out how to do it. And our job can then be helping them find resources to scale and, and do larger. That's one of the things that hurts, I think, every community college in the country is that a lot of people are innovative, but they can't get beyond the pilot stage. And, and so those who go from pilot to, to at scale are the ones who are more successful at sometimes just letting go and sometimes being taken very care of and going, no, no, you're on the right track. You don't have to let go. I'll let go. You don't have to. And so... That's what it's about sometimes, and yeah. you know, it's it's a hard dance, and and I fully recognize that as always a concern. Yeah, and uh, that's why we're we want to build these partnerships with people as a kind of a first time. To, I, I'm really curious to see how it works out and how it can be done. Where between academics and occupational can work together. You know, the other variable inside of that for me has been change in leadership. You spend a lot of time building a relationship with somebody and you have agreements and you have all of this. And then the deck gets shuffled, you know, and faculty are generally here for a long time. You know, the faculty that I know, like in our department, people start here and retire from here because they love teaching. They love our camp. I do. I mean, I just love Mesa Community College. You know, I love everything about it. I have no desire. I've had plenty of opportunities, but I, I just, I don't have a desire. You know, I really like what's going on here. You have that. So I'm, I'm curious to find out as we explore these partnerships of what, how that's going to look. So I'm real encouraged to hear that you're there. Uh, we, we will probably come talk to you about Because yeah. we had this, you know, huge scale up to do all what we're doing on all 10 campuses. And then COVID hit and it was just like somebody punched us in the gut. Right? Yeah. And then, you know, you throw in the, the change in leadership on top of that. You know, one of the things about community college leadership is that on average, the person's going to be here three to five years and half of us have an interim title, it seems like. And, yeah. you know, it's, that's a nationwide problem. That's, yeah. you know, and, and we do have a lot of people who, spend their entire careers here. And that's fantastic. That is so needed. You know, when we talk about first-generation college students, we talk about them not having the social capital to navigate a community college system. Well, the same thing applies to faculty and administrators, especially in the very beginning. You know, a new, when we have new leadership who comes in, they have very little social capital outside of their title. You know, they're, they go, I have a title that gives me access to certain things. Yeah. But people who've been here for 20 years goes, that's nice, but here are the realities that you need to be aware of that you don't know yet. And so, again, it comes back to that teamwork. It comes back to trust. And it comes back to just recognizing that, you know, we're all in this together. We may be going in different directions, but those directions generally align in the same general area. They just may not be going exactly the same way. Yeah. And we can figure these, all of this out. I believe that, you know, I think Maricopa is an untapped, uh, we, we've not even come close to our potential. I think when I, 20 years ago, you know, we were pretty much the only game in town and that's changed a little bit. Well, I'd argue you know? 20 years ago, you were a nationwide phenomenon. Um, Absolutely. Because on the East Coast, you know, I was hearing a lot about what was going on in Maricopa. Yeah. I heard what was going on in MCLI. And so as my career brought me in this direction, it felt natural to come here because I still feel Maricopa is a major national player and we have a lot to say and do still. That's right. And I want to maintain that and the talent that we have so much talent here. So, you know, when we talk about innovation and, and scale and all of this, we do have to consider our infrastructure of management and all that. And I think, I think we can, uh, 
a lot of smart people here. We can figure it out. But we just, there's a few adjustments I think that if we made in our governing board and our legislature and all of that could trust us a little more with the, with the, what we have, the resources that we have, I think we could, they would see results quickly in changing the models of, uh, you know, kind of the top, top down corporate single, uh, when you have, you have 10 people that have high end, uh, PhD work in a field around management. Why not manage things more from a team perspective than a singular person? But th- these are big changes that we're, ex- you know, we're just exploring. Oh, yeah. And I would like to see that. I'd like to see more unity around that. And if, because this is the thing we're going to talk about in our next podcast with faculties is, is it's such a drastic culture for me. And most faculty, when you land at a college or a university that you really love, you're going to stay there. Administrators, like you just pointed out, three to five years, their culture is to constantly be moving on, right? Kind of moving into things, try to build a few things, get some recognition, move on. We're not, the faculty are not like that. So the consistency rests within the departments and the faculty, and we need to understand that dynamic let if people want to become a dean and then a vice president and a president let that happen but let's not let that be disruptive to the consistent day-to-day operations well and and that three to five number comes from the fact that it used to be five to seven years and it used to be faculty moved from a faculty role into administrative role in many institutions more than they do today yeah. And so you, when, you, when you don't have faculty rising through administration and then retiring as an administrator but remaining a faculty member post-administration, things have changed. And that, that's led to, I think, a lot of you know, administrators changing institutions for, for opportunities because yeah. there's a demand for it. That's right. For me personally, I don't, I don't look at the top levels for a lot of this. I, I think for me the most interesting places are in the margins. When you look at the gaps, you know, when, yeah. when a group of faculty and a group of staff either individually or together or collectively go, hey, there's a gap and that needs to be filled. And you have an environment where you can explore the margins. And, and that's where the real innovation, in my opinion, happens. Well, I would love to have a whole different infrastructure of leadership and trust and all those pieces in place. I think, you know, as, as long as I have it you know, with my team and with the faculty and the staff I work with and the other administrators I work with, that's, I value that more because of our ability to work in the margins and do some really cool things that are not yet explored. That's right. No, you're talking our language now. And I think that's what happens, you know, that's where it happens is, yeah, I like that in the gap or in the margins and the hallway and the whatever we're going to get, we're going to get stuff done. Yeah. It's really, it's really good. Like I say, I, I just think we could, it's a pretty easy fix in one way. And we, we, and that's another thing about it. Even with all of the interim and all of that, Mesa has been just solid for us as we move innovation forward. Because, you know, it, again, it comes down to the people that work here and want to work here. And so I think that's always should be included in innovation and entrepreneurial initiatives is that we do recognize that that's just one little part of it, right? Yeah. And uh, I think we're doing a, a good job of that. So, hey, man, tell me something good about the future. What do, you, what do you got coming up in the next few years? So, you know, when we look at some of these things that are coming on, you know, the pandemic, for as devastating as it was, as I said earlier, everything is broken. This is our opportunity to kind of say, hey, let's, we can fix everything. And so... This is the, you know, this is where I think a lot of the folks who have that entrepreneur and innovation mindset are kind of looking at things going, asking that what if louder than normal, and they're getting people responding back. And, and while many of us have not been in the office and in the hallways to have these conversations, I think a lot of us have been connecting within our own teams and asking that question more than we ever have, because we're being more intentional with our communications than we were in the past. I know myself as a leader, I realized I had a lot of great communications with my team in the office, but they were all 
oh, as I pass someone's desk or as I see them in the hallway. And now we have to be much more intentional about those communications and having that conversation. And because of that, I think we're being, dare I use the word productive, more productive, um, but it, we're being more creative because we're like, hey, this is something that needs to be dealt with. So I, I think it's helped us in, in a lot of regards. And I know that for my team, there was a lot of discomfort with the pandemic. And and we've learned to navigate that discomfort. We've learned to accept it in some cases and go, what can we do different? And so that's led us to thinking about, you know, how do we, you know, webinars are here to stay. We were, we were looking to do webinars across the district, but the pandemic put us in a position where they were the only choice. And, and I think they were the right choice even pre-pandemic. And so what's been nice this year is we've had an opportunity to, um, to do some innovation and entrepreneurship uh, webinars where we've been able to highlight different programs. And, you know, we have the uh, Phoenix Forge coming online, which is the new makerspace. We, we've been able to, to work with different folks to highlight what they're doing. And we're going to be doing that even more so uh, in the next couple of weeks with our annual Innovation of the Year Awards, where we've been working with the colleges to help identify, you know, different programs and different things that are going on and, and recognizing those. And we're going to do that at the end of March. And we're trying to build a framework to think about it differently. And yeah. so as we look at where we go next, and let's, let's talk about post-pandemic, because that's coming. We know that we're going to have to do something that's both physical because we need those hallway conversations, but we also know it needs to also be online, virtual, because not everybody can make it to a physical location. And we need to also replicate that social experience so they're not left out. So we know that's something that has to come. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really exciting, man, what you're doing. I look forward to partnering with you all and working with you. People are constantly telling me you have to go for the League of Innovation Award and this award and that award. I'm just, it's not a thing for me, even though people, I, I understand all of the work that our team has put on, it'd be nice for everyone to be recognized in that way. The Mesa Business Commerce gave us this award, you know, but I just felt uncomfortable the whole way through and afterwards, you know, I, I, I just, I want to, I'm trying to figure out ways to recognize people on, on also that incorporates cultural intelligence of how that, what that looks like, you know, in, uh, in our, in our tribal cultures, when you give a gift to somebody, it used to be at least things have changed and modernized and assimilation, but the older people, elders, I guess, if you were going to give somebody something or recognize them, you never did that directly. You always let someone else do that. You know, there was a relative that would stand in and speak and I think I'd like to see some cultural ways that people get recognized, you know? Yeah, I'm with Rather you. than like a big, uh, you know, it feels, you know what I mean? It just, Yo, yeah. I'll leave it at that. I just want to figure it, out a way to start to do that that recognizes people's culture and, and, and stuff with recognizing them or doesn't really put them on the spot so much, you know? It is, and, it is a hard thing, yeah. I think, for people like us because we, what we're doing makes sense to us. There's nothing. And, so, and often I feel like some of the things I do and then I, I get recognized for, I'm going, that wasn't special. I, I was just doing what I do. It made sense. Yeah, it it, it right. wasn't a leap in my mind, but to others it was and apparently because, you know, they, they submitted you for an award and, and, and it's hard. It's, it, when you're in the middle of it like we are, you know, we look at what we're doing as just the next step of our, of our evolution, nothing, nothing yeah. special. Right. And yet... You know, others are going, oh, no, you need to apply for this award. And I, I have a hard time applying for awards for myself. I'd rather submit somebody else for an award much yeah. more than myself. And yeah. so I hear what you're saying. Yeah. And we did. I think other people did nominate us and all that. I'm just saying, you know, it's sometimes, you know, a lot of the students that come here, you know, they don't have that personality of needing this validation from some organization they don't know. You know, they just, just yeah. you know, let's have a night where we all, Let's rent the theater and show our films and just appreciate each other and, you know, bring some pizza. You know, let's get back to that. There that's, you go. that's good enough for me. So 
that is exciting, and uh, I am really, uh, I'm really glad you reached out to us to have this conversation. I hope folks across the district will uh, listen and you know, kind of join in, and let's figure out how to get more partnerships and more community and sharing of resources together. That's all good, good stuff. We like to always give our guests the the last statement in the in the podcast. Is there anything you want to say to folks? I, I think my final words would be to just be creative, be bold. There's never a good time to do anything. So might as well as go for it when you have the chance and, and take it. You know, this is, you know, this has been a very interesting time that we've been in and this is the time to be bold. And I'll just come back to that word and, uh, and just think about how, how can we make things better for others as we do that. Yeah, I like that. All right, everybody. We want to thank uh, Dr. Stephen Crawford for joining us. He's the uh, district director for the Maricopa Center of Learning and Innovation at Maricopa Community Colleges here in Maricopa County in Arizona. I hope our audience starts to build out more and more across the country. And uh, we really want to thank you for joining us today. And as they say in my dad's language, Tona de Cojon y Wadol.